thank you very much to the TTIP Information Network for inviting me, but more particularly, um, I'd like to add my thanks um, to those of Ruth for the work that's been done by a very small core group in managing and keeping um, this whole sort of focus on TTIP going, because it's all too easy to be distracted by the everyday and the personal issues that we all have to deal with and the professional issues that we all have to deal with and to lose sight of something which um, is going to have such a fundamental effect in all of our lives. Um, so um, I'm very conscious that we're running very much behind time at this stage. So you'll forgive me, but I am actually going to really, really rattle through these slides. Um, but if there's anything particularly that you want to pick up on, and then hopefully we can address that in the Q&A. But I just want to set out some things. Um, um, so, um, and just for the record, my name's Attracta. All right. Um, so first of all, thank you very much. It's a Saturday morning. It's very nice weather and you've all taken the time to be here. So I'm conscious you're either very familiar with TTIP and are rightly worried, or you've just heard a little bit about it and you want to know more about it. And I'm trying to sort of cover both ends of the equation, some people who may be much more expert than I am, and some people who are just coming to learn. So that's sort of the approach that I'm trying to take in this presentation, to sort of pitch to the middle ground, but moving from the basics quickly up to some of the more complicated elements. So we're going to go through some of the basics, um, and then we're going to talk very particularly, as this session indicates, about climate change and the implications of TTIP and it, um, and very particularly positioned at Anthashka and some of our environmental colleagues in the environmental pillar, which is a coalition of some 28 EN of the foremost ENGOs in the country who work together to advocate for environment on environmental issues would have um, and sustainability in agri-food sector uh, and welfare on TTIP but obviously we have some people who are very expert in both Claire and Ruth who will cover those areas more substantively. Um, I'd also like to focus a little bit on the news in terms of practically what's happening in terms of decisions and what we potentially can do in terms of lobbying. I think that's really important. I think Monsanto's communication strategy when it was leaked was very uh, interesting because the whole thing is to actually, the whole strategy is about overwhelming people with information and a feeling of futility. Um, and what is critically important is actually to be able to give people something to be able to do. Otherwise, people become apathetic. They think there's nothing they can do, and they turn away. So we have to be continually focused on, we can do something about this, and we must do. And we must give others something to do and something to engage with. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the fact that TTIP isn't the only bogeyman out there, and that this is part of a very deeply concerning, concerted effort that is happening, particularly in the EU. Um, so, um, ambitious, so I'll start talking fast, okay? The TTIP negotiations, the guide for dummies, that's for me. I had to do a lot of swatting up because it's a while since I've been looking at this in detail. Um, basically, what I'm going to cover is what it is, a little bit about the stats, just building on what Ruth said in her intro, um, and I'm going to talk about some of the core issues. Uh, around transparency, ISDS, regulatory coherence, fast track ratification, and just touching very, just mentioning really the, some of the sectoral policy issues. So TTIP, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, that's what it stands for. And basically in summer 2013, the EU and the US began negotiations. And finally the mandate for those negotiations was released. Um, but there was a lot of concern in the beginning about exactly what was being discussed and the scope of it. But basically, it's seen as the largest bilateral trade agreement in EU history. But it's one of a number of negotiations, um, and I'm sure many of you will be aware of things like CETA, which have yet to become before th the European Parliament. Um, <coughs> so this shouldn't be seen in isolation, and what's happening in one agreement will have ramifications and implications for others, and we need to be conscious of this. As Ruth said in her intro, what we do know for a fact is the tariffs between the EU and the US are low. So the focus of the agreement is clearly not on that. And what has become apparent with increased leaks of documents and very welcome increased transparency regarding some of the negotiation texts, certainly on the EU side, absolutely not on the US side, um, is that um, that is clearly not the case. It's not tariff focused. It's on reducing barriers to trade uh, in other areas through things like regulatory convergence and terms like this I will go into in a little bit more detail. Um, so 
basically, moving on from that, the stats. Um, so why is this such a big deal? Um, basically, the largest trade relationship globally is that which exists between the EU and the US. One only just has to think about the consumer nature of our societies to see that that's fairly self-evident. But just to put some stats on that, 2.2 billion on goods and services is traded daily. So this is of huge significance to big industry. Over half of global GDP is accounted for between the EU and the US and a third of all world trade flows. Mm -hmm. um, so is this necessarily a bad thing in itself? Well, trade, no, isn't bad, uh, but not trade at any price. And I suppose that's the fundamental, certainly the we message that many of us in the TTIP information network and particularly on Tashka would be bringing to the table here today. Trade is good, but not at any price and particularly when it's at the cost of our democracy, our environment and our health, which is what our concern is. So, some of the core issues, certainly very much in the beginning, one of the big issues was, well, what actually is TTP all ab about? It was the issue of transparency. And there has been a very concerted effort to try and bring pressure to bear and ensure that there is a greater level of transparency on these international trade talks. But still, there is nothing comparable with what's happening in other similar international negotiations, such as climate, etc. Albeit the climate talks are obviously deeply unsatisfactory in other areas, but the level of transparency here is very far <laughs> from another other international uh, arrangements. Um, so one of the things we do know very definitely is that there are proposals for a thing called ISDS, it's the way it's typically referred to, which is an investor state dispute settlement mechanism. And basically um, the reality is that this is a very real um, mechanism which has been around since the 1950s, uh, which is actively used um, by companies to sue governments when governments take action which restricts or impacts upon their profitability. So for example, Lone Pine has sued the state of Quebec for 250 million because of legislative regulations introduced. Valdenfan, um, is suing Germany for restrictions that they have introduced in the nuclear industry. And basically what is proposed here is that instead of recourse to the courts and our legal system, um, that basically companies can sue governments in a non-judicial environment, in a closed environment, uh, in a tribunal type setting for which we would have had no access to. One of the biggest issues with this is not just the impact that it would have in terms of governments being sued, but what is known as regulatory chill. Governments start stopping to regulate because they are fearful of being sued. And in the context of the EU, the EU might start to stop to regulate. And as we know, many of our very important and very good environmental regulations and protection mechanisms have actually derived from the EU. Um, so this is a very, very real concern and we're actually potentially, many of us feeling that we're already seeing this in relation to proposals on cloning, which the EU is bringing forward, which we feel have been restricted uh, based on the desire to make sure that they don't create too much of a kerfuffle or a difficulty in relation to the TTIP negotiations. So they're not as ambitious as one would have normally expected the EU would have, have pursued. So. It's very real, and what we do know is there has been some consultation on this, an appalling consultation document which I spent six hours on a Sunday <laughs> afternoon trying to fill out, I might add. Um, but uh, So it wasn't the most user-friendly, it uh, wasn't the most widely publicised public consultation. Um, but what the EU is proposing is um, an ISDS light, a nice version of ISDS. And clearly our position is that that doesn't exist. You know, we want recourse to our courts. Um, you know, ISDS is absolutely unacceptable uh, as a mechanism. So that's one of the big no's in TTIP. In relation to many of the other elements, the difficulty is that a lot is being negotiated. 
So the US produces text, the EU produces text, and nobody knows exactly what the final text is actually going to end up with. But what we can be clear about, and we can be very consistent in our articulations about, um, and this is very much the approach that we've taken in Antarctica, is what we don't want. So we don't want to lower our environmental safeguards. We don't want uh, our personal and civil liberties uh, and rights of access to justice um, to be compromised. We don't want to lessen standards for our health. We don't want to lessen standards for our workers. Okay? And that is the threat in terms of some of the things that are on the table in terms of reducing trade barriers, that they will lead to that through many of the mechanisms such as fast-track ratification of amendments. So basically, even if the EP, the European Parliament, can ultimately have a, a say uh, and exercise its democratic uh, voice in relation to the proposals for TTIP, subsequent amendments to the text and the agreement will be made without recourse to the EP, which is one of the biggest issues. So it's effectively a blank checkbook with total loss of oversight. So fast track ratification would be one of the most, so a lot of the annexes, a lot of the, the finer detail in terms of what can be covered and what can be additionally covered um, can basically be written after the agreement is finalised, which would be deeply concerning. Um, sorry, some of the other things that I suppose we're, we're deeply concerned about here would be um, convergence of regulation which many of us feel means a, a race to the bottom. So what, wh what happens here is that standards are looked at in relation to what standards are in the US and what the standards are in the EU with a view of equalizing or leveling the playing field. But for many of us, we feel that that's actually a race downhill, um, that it won't actually result in a raising of standards, but actually a lowering of standards. Um, and we've only got to be mindful of the power of, of lobby groups uh, in relation to the pressures that they can put on, on uh, governments in relation to those types of decisions. Also, there are um, proposals in relation to trade committees, um, which effectively remove a lot of the responsibilities from government in relation to trade um, agreements and standards, and that's hugely problematic as well. So, moving then on to some of the very particular issues in this session, climate change. Okay, I'm just going to set a little bit of context for climate change, um, and that's the last of the funny cartoons. Okay, because it gets serious now. <laughs> um, but the reality is, there is nothing more serious than climate change. It is the defining challenge of our time. It threatens all of our human rights today and it threatens the human rights of every generation to come if we don't take our responsibility to do something about it. According to the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, okay, which is our scientific community and their synthesis report from policymakers, these are its observations and its recommendations to policymakers. Human influence on climate change is clear. Continued emissions of greenhouse gases will cause further warning and long-lasting changes in all components of the climate system, increasing the likelihood of severe, pervasive and irreversible impacts for people and ecosystems. This is a scientific community telling us the reality. Limiting climate change would require substantial and sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, which together with adaptation can limit climate change risks. So they are telling us if we act, we can do something. They talk about the projected changes in climate system and they talk about the effects in terms of increased um, acidity, precipitation events um, and heat waves, which can have detrimental effects on the production of crops on flood events and are particularly problematic for our, our more vulnerable, disadvantaged people and communities um, in less developed countries. They very much ask for a call to arms on this, if you'll forgive the expression. <laughs> 
and saying statements like, without additional efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions beyond those in place today, global emissions growth is expected to persist, driven by growth in global population and economic development. Sorry, it's a typo there. So without additional mitigation efforts beyond those in place today, and even with adaptation, warming by the end of the 21st century will lead to high to very high risk of, of severe, widespread and irreversible impacts globally. They also say that what we actually need is substantial emissions reduction over the next few decades and near zero emissions of CO2 and other long-lived greenhouse gases by the end of the century. And they absolutely make it clear that they recognise that that will actually bring very severe challenges to us in terms of economically, technically, socially, um, on every level. But the longer we delay, the more difficult those technical challenges will be to overcome. So my question is, in the face of the US's abysmal failure on climate action, why are we getting into bed with it on trade? Why are we talking? to the US on trade? Why are we not requiring first that the US actually rise to its obligations on climate change ad adaptation and mitigation first so that we can confidently acknowledge that we have a shared environment and a common interest in relation to human rights standards and environmental responsibility? This has got to be a prerequisite to such discussions. And I think it's probably the most important message I have today because this is the most important environmental issue. It is the most important human rights issue that we're going to talk about today. Um, and we should actually be saying, we can't have confidence in the US's recognition of our environmental interests if they don't do something on climate change. Then looking at the context and the specifics of the agreement would be a separate activity. Um, and again, it would absolutely need to be evaluated in terms of its um, environmental significance and its social um, significance. But within TTIP, there are some very significant um, climate implications because Europe hasn't is far from being best in class on this, um, and it has an awful lot of work to do um, to really properly address its own climate change responsibilities as well. Um, but TTIP potentially could actually make that much more difficult, and that is one of the biggest concerns that we have. Um, so that's a quote from the EB's policy position paper on TTIP, which I would recommend to you because it gives a very comprehensive, objective and balanced overview of TTIP and the various different elements of it. So one of the big worries that about TTIP in terms of our ability to pursue climate change um, mitigation and adaptation is the chilling effect that I spoke about earlier from the regulatory convergence and the ISDS. So when governments are actually looking to bring in um, increased regulation or, for example, um, <coughs> looking the EU as a whole is looking to increase standards in relation to car emissions, there could be the concern that they will be stand to be sued by big business and big car industries, for example. So standards that we want to in, in, um, address, such as energy efficiency labelling, fuel efficiency standards, green or sustainable public procurement policies, uh, regulation on unconventional fossil fuels, all of these critically important things could all stand to be influenced and be compromised by TTIP. And they are fundamental absolutely fundamental and critical to our ability to be able to address climate. So effectively, TTIP could emasculate our ability to address climate. Um, so moving on from that, um, I'd like to talk very briefly about TTIP and farm and animal welfare. Um, there's a lot of concern about the very um, uh, intense farming practices in the US and the extensive use of chemicals and hormones in the US um, and the fact that um, 
while the, the EU has pursued uh, a policy of farm to fork visibility and traceability, um, that's quite different to the experience in the US. Um, now the Commission is of the view that basically um, they can use TTIP to improve and to influence what will happen in the US and one would hope that that could possibly be the fact. But the reality is um, the EU although it has some very good regulations and it has some very, very powerful um, uh, fundamental principles in the Treaty of the Functioning of, of the EU in relation to Article 13, recognising the sentient nature of animals, it is actually still very poor at protecting animal rights and welfare. And in this regard, I would really recommend to you some of the work that's been done by Compassion and World Farming and the work that they've done particularly on TTIP and the reference material that they've developed in that. Today, I don't have the, the time that I would like to go into this area, but there are huge and significant issues still within animal welfare uh, within the EU, despite our regulations. Um, so the, the notion that we are actually in, in, in a good position to improve what will happen in the US is of deep concern. The uh, chapter basically on animal welfare in, in TTIP um, produced by the EU does recognise in art the Article 13 principles of the sentience of animals. It talks about exchange of information and know-how. It talks about alignment um, of regulatory standards, strengthening collaboration, uh, promoting good practices, possible appointment of working groups. It all sounds very positive, but it's all very woolly. It's all peppered with extremely non-binding language, unenforceable provisions. And this is the problem. So we have nothing that we have seen that actually gives credibility to the notion that we can actually deliver positive influence on this space. Um, I know that Ruth and Caroline are going to talk an awful lot more about food, so I'm going to just move very swiftly over but these issues. But there are significant issues in relation to, to the US practices in relation to chlorinated chicken, uh, the use of hormones in, in beef, um, restrictions on labelling. Um, we all very familiar with our labelling on eggs and the whole history of how that came into being. Um, and a lot of these issues have huge significance for the way our small farmers in Ireland in particular farm, the pressures that they will be under to reduce their sustainable practices, farm more intensively in order to be cost effective and to be able to compete in the face of influx of cheaper imports, which will happen, and the additional issue of um, change standards um, and costs associated with that. So the general position is that the process of intensification will privilege US and U EU intensive production methods at the expense of more sustainable and agricultural practices. Ireland has pursued a policy and a position of being a clean, green, agricultural uh, producing nation. Now many of us might question um, th the real depth of that um, claim. But nonetheless, compared to others, we do have a lot to be proud of. And our sustainable practices are intrinsically linked to the viability of small farming practices and the way we actually manage our landscape. And those two things taken together are critically important for two of our most important indigenous industries in Ireland, agri-food and tourism. Our landscape is critically important. And what we are already seeing is significant removal of hedgerows, significant draining of land across the country, which is changing the nature of our landscape and changing the nature of the animals and the and species that actually um, can live in that environment. So in terms of TTIP and what's at stake, basically the future direction of food and farming is at stake and the model of agriculture that we as citizens want and the type of food that we want to eat and the type of food that we want to give our children. Um, so moving on very quickly then to the news, um, so I'm just conscious I'm running a um, little, okay. Um, 
TTIP negotiations, I wouldn't dream of trying to take you through the whole complicated. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure that anybody actually could take anyone through the whole complicated um, remit of the TTIP negotiations. But I do put up there the website, which is the official website in relation to the, the, the um, DG Trades overview of what's happening on TTIP. Uh, and it is, there is some interesting and useful information on it. But what is happening at the moment is particularly important because the European Parliament has a number of committees in which our, our, mem our MEPs sit and work. Um, some of them as are assigned to these um, committees um, and as, as members of them and some of them as substitute members. So people can appear in multiple committees but have different levels of responsibility um, in that. So basically um, what's happening at the moment is these different committees, they're like little <laughs> test uh, think tanks in relation to various different issues is the way I like to think about it. And they have particular areas of expertise. So obviously the Environment Committee considers and is populated with people who are concerned about environmental issues and have some expertise in this area in terms of their researchers and their support. Um, and the... Um, ANVI and Agri committees um, have actually already given opinions on TTIP. And by giving opinions on TTIP, that actually is going to flow into um, the Trade Committee. And the Trade Committee is actually going to be critically important in providing an opinion to the Parliament. And that in turn is believed will significantly influence the view that the Parliament will actually take when the TTIP negotiation comes before it. So um, the, the Trade Committee is due to meet on the 7th of May and that will be followed by the plenary uh, of the EP, which as I understand it was to be on the 20th, but I believe that that is going to be pushed out if it hasn't been already. Okay. So the idea is that the Trade Committee will take account of the opinions from the other committees, um, which may be good or bad, um, but it should take those opinions into account. While I've mentioned ANVI and AGRI, there are some 14 committees in total that will be giving opinions. And unfortunately today I'm not in a position to say whether all of those have actually formulated their opinion, um, whether that's still in process and what all of those opinions are. I think it's something we actually need to find out about and I'll certainly do my best to, to do that and follow through on that uh, and feed that back to the network. Because I think there's a critical lobbying exercise to be done um, and just to give you a little bit of context for that, I'm going to talk about what's happened um, very specifically with the ANVI and the AGRI committees and how critical what's happening there is. Um, in terms of information on those EP committees, it can be found at that address. Basically, by clicking on the little orange box, uh, what you can do is actually find out who the members of the committees are, you can find out details about the meetings, you can find out basically the agendas. So it can be very useful for a whole range of things, not just TTIP, but a whole range of issues which may be of concern to you. So in terms of the ANVI committee, just to give you a heads up, and I hope I've got all of them, but I may, may have missed some, so um, just inadvertently, um, the Irish MEPs sitting on the AGRI committee are Lynn Boylan, Nessa Childers, Brian Crowley, Luke Ming Flanagan, Mairead McGuinness, um, but let's not lose sight of our MEPs in Northern Ireland and also in the UK, where there may be some particularly common interests. Um, um, but, I mean, we shouldn't be afraid of lobbying all of our MEPs. Um, we are all members of the European Union. Um, so, when ANVI looked at the opinion um, that had been prepared by the rapporteurs and following on their discussions, they voted in favour of a critical position on TTIP, with a very large majority, <laughs> as you can see there yourselves, and an absolute majority explicitly opposing ISDS. So this is all very welcome. And they also sought clear safeguards on policies, principles and procedures, no lowering of standards existing and future. They excluded five areas from the negotiations, and you can see them there yourself. Um, and they also voted to limit regulatory cooperation to specified areas and they also voted to increase transparency. So this is all good news, but one has to remember that this is non-binding. But it is a very important indicator of the political feeling out there. And 
MEPs are politicians and politicians listen to people and what we have to do is make politicians hear us and our friends, colleagues and everyone who is concerned about TTIP. This is critically important in terms of mobilisation. So the Agri Committee on the other hand, um, Irish MEPs, and I'm not casting any aspersions on the way people voted, sorry, in, in doing that, I'm just saying Irish MEPs, McCarthy, Luke Ming, Flanagan, Mairead McGuinness, uh, and again, don't f lose sight of our MEPs in Northern Ireland and the UK, but just for time reasons today, I didn't list them all, and my slides are busy enough as it is. Um, but some of the, the difficulties we have in here, um, and I'll, I'll have to be um, diplomatic in how I put this, um, are the rapporteurs. Um, I think some of us will be aware of um, some of the challenges presented in the CAP reform talks uh, where some of these rapporteurs were involved previously. Um, the Agri opinion uh, was adopted with 27 votes in favour and 18 against. Um, it mentions agriculture as a highly strategic political issue on which food security and the way of life of all Europeans depend. Um, but one commentator has said that the outcome overall from the opinion is not good and far from the one in envy because the opinion is supportive of consumer interests, not necessarily bad in itself, food safety, absolutely very good, and the precautionary principle, absolutely essential, but is in favour of a reformed ISDS and a comprehensive regulatory cooperation. So it's what comes after the but is deeply problematic and extremely concerning. So this is the Agricultural Committee of the EU. These should be our guardians and this is what they are advocating. This is the, what their opinion to the European Parliament is. This is deeply worrying and fundamentally problematic. So, um, moving on from that, um, the whole issue of TTIP and what's happening in the EU, I think, needs to be taken in a much wider context of what's happened with the new Commission structure uh, under the new presidency, um, which we've seen just, I suppose, in, in the last 12 months or so. What we've seen is a deprioritization of environment and climate through the management and the way that the commission's commissioners portfolios have been assigned and in the mandates that have been given them and the restrictions and the limitations that have been put on them in bringing forward new regulations uh, in respect of environmental protection. We've also seen deeply worrying um, uh, proposals for modernization uh, of the birds and habitats directives where modernization for many of us is a byword for emasculate. Um, so what's happening is there is very significant uh, and also in addition to the new, the new structure we now have a whole instead of having a very flat structure as we had previously we have a hierarchy of VPs um, through which our commissioners actually need to work um, and this again limits uh, very much and creates a hierarchy of control um, with through people with very specific agendas um, within the EU. Very problematically, and some of you may or may not be familiar with this, is the Access to Justice initiative is under fire. Now, if ISDS is bad, access to justice is good. Okay? It arises basically from the Aarhus Convention, which is a human rights convention, which recognises the importance of a healthy environment to us all as a basic human right. Um, and there are three pillars within it. Um, one of those is access to justice. And basically, the, it gives any citizen the right to challenge decisions pertaining to the environment um, based on that human rights convention. And a, a review of those decisions which is fair, timely, effective, and not a prohibitive cost. It is effectively the antithesis of ISDS. And what we're seeing is the proposals to bring forward a directive which would facilitate the implementation of access to justice and the more effective implementation of the Aarhus Convention throughout the EU uh, was not only shelved, but new proposals are very uncertain in terms of how, when, or if at all they will be brought forward as a binding legislative instrument or whether they will be just less um, 
less effective in terms of guidelines. Announcements are expected on that imminently, but I would think that part of what we should actually be mobilising in saying no to ISDS is adopt access to justice. You know, it goes back to what I was saying earlier in terms of giving people a positive, giving people an action. It's not just no, 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 it's we want, we want the alternative and clearly indicating what the alternative is that we want. So now and next, we may feel like the little man in the top left hand corner, all alone. <laughs> um, but the reality is, um, our voices have got to be heard. And if we mobilise, we can make the two cats in the corner negotiate. And that's the challenge that we actually have to do with the EU and the US in terms of mobilisation of citizens to protect their interests and their rights. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you.